the first time I heard Bitcoin. Welcome back to another episode of Artist to Artist presented by Artist Public. I'm Nick, that's Christian. And please remember, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcast. If you did last week, you would have gotten a free freestyle recording from Christian. Now, if you stay to the end of this episode, you may find out what you will get if you give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever the hell you get your podcasts. Now, before we dive in, Christian, what is going on in the media this week? So this is actually pretty interesting. Um, a article that came out on Billboard uh, talked about how a recent study claims that in 2018, the music industry in the United States contributed to about $170 billion to the economy, which equates to about 50 cents to every dollar made in the ind- in the music industry alone. Um, I don't know. I don't know about you, man. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, the fact that just the music industry alone is able to contribute $170 billion to the U.S. economy. Yeah, I mean... I've never met a single person that's like, I don't like music. Um, (laughs) You know, music has been ingrained in in everything from, you know, the start of life. You know, bacteria, bacteria just bumps to music, you know, every, every, there's not a species or organism on this great planetary journey in this universe or any universe that doesn't like music, um, in my opinion. But yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, the, the music industry is a lot bigger than people think. It's um, a lot more powerful than people think. And um, yeah, so that, that doesn't surprise me too much. But I mean, it's awesome that it's 50 cents to every dollar. You know, I think it's, for me, it's interesting because traditionally when you think of the music industry, I'd say the general consumer of music, when they think of the industry, they only think of the artists. They don't think too much about all of the other jobs that come into play, you know, all the way from the top level executives at the major labels down to that small venue in your hometown. Um, and that's down to the photographers, down to the studios, photographers, the recording studios, like, People that make posters. Yeah, the music industry just like, it is huge. It's, it's one of the biggest industries in the United States, but I don't think a lot of people consider that. They, they, they think real jobs, right? Quote, unquote, yeah. real jobs contributing to the economy. They don't think about a creative art like music can, contri- can contribute so much to an economy. And that's just in the United States. You know, I, I can't even imagine what that would look like if you did that study around the world yeah yeah no that's 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 a really good point i mean it's massive everything's music music is probably one of the i may get some backlash for this but i would say it's probably one of the easiest industries to enter so to say there aren't many barriers to entry you know you don't like there's barriers to greatness but there's not many barriers to entry you know, really all you need is your mind and something that makes a sound. And on the most simplest forms of a lot of things, it's very simple to be able to create music just for fun as a hobby. Um, You know, I can create music with a five gallon drum and a fork and I can go create a song and to some extent. Um, But I think that, but that's true music. And, you know, you can really, you know, anybody can make sounds and music and you know make it sound good um to some extent so probably someone's going to leave us a bad review and say music is not that easy to enter and nick has no idea what he's talking about but when you think about it it is um so you know there definitely is i like to compare it oh here we go now we're now we're on a tangent fried lie the sin music is like it's like entrepreneurship there there's different areas of easiness you know the simplest form of entrepreneurship is drug dealing um, you know, the, the simplest form of music is just creating sounds, you know, what level you are on that scale determines a lot of things. Um, but to the easiest extent, yes, you know, music is everywhere. It's in everyone and, you know, anyone can embrace it and be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, while we're on the topic of money, uh, Nick, why don't you introduce our next guest? Yeah. 
Well, speaking of the complications of the music industry, and more importantly, the future of music and money, um, one of our special guests today is Stephen Cole. Uh, he is a professional who is a bit different than most people we've had on here. Um, he is an investor that is focused primarily in cryptocurrency and specifically Bitcoin. Prior to his shift towards investing, this guy led web technology teams at a variety of Silicon Valley companies. Nowadays, he runs meetups and educational events, invests in startups, and probably knows way more rap lyrics than you. That is a direct quote from Stephen. Please give us a helping hand in introducing our friend, Stephen Cole. Well, Stephen, glad to, glad to have you back in a, in a meeting. I think this is, you know, a much different version of me that you'll see um, than, you know, we, we've talked about in the past, um, but glad to have you on, um, you know, probably one of the most more unique people we've had on the podcast um, with a much different perspective, because, you know, not only does he know more rap lyrics than any of you listening, but he definitely probably knows more about the future of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and all that fun stuff, which we know most of the people listening are music artists. So don't worry, we won't get too into the weeds where you're like, God damn, I didn't know I was paying for a LinkedIn learning class. But I would like to get into the weeds on different topics of how Bitcoin impacting the music industry, how you see it going in the music industry, because I see it left and right. I'm not as much of a Bitcoin believer as you are, obviously, I haven't even bought a dollar in Bitcoin. Um, I'm still going to be laughing my butt off if Dogecoin actually works because um, it's a damn coin with a dog on it. But <laughs> yes, with that, let's get in. I would love to hear first things first. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, both on you know your love for music and your experience in the Bitcoin and crypto world and all that fun stuff. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you all having me on too. Uh, I know I, when I looked back at the past episodes and the roster of folks you've had on before, I know I don't fit the bill exactly. Like you said, <laughs> a little bit more into the Bitcoin scene, a little bit more into the tech scene, but music has had a special place in my heart, huge passion of mine for a long time. And so I'm particularly excited about the intersection of, you know, music, online streaming, um, creative artists, and then the type of, I think, like leverage and freedom that perhaps these types of technologies can offer. Um, so my, a little bit about my background, just kind of the angle I'm coming at things from uh, born and raised in the Midwest in the U.S., grew up in a small town, studied computer science in college. And then uh, I did about 10 years in Silicon Valley. So I was working. I started my career at eBay. Um, I was an engineer there for a while. That was where I kind of figured out how in the world big websites work and like what makes them tick. And, and then after a few years there, I joined some small startup companies around San Francisco. So uh, an artificial intelligence startup called Nirvana Systems that was later acquired by Intel. And I worked for a cloud computing startup called Cloud Scaling. Um, and so, you know, those were kind of the years like 2008 to 2017 or so. Uh, but in 2013, I heard about this Bitcoin thing and I got really intrigued. And so outside of my primary day job, uh, the passion definitely became Bitcoin. All my free brain cycles were going towards learning more about it, figuring out why it might be a big deal and just trying to understand it better. Um, and then for the last couple of years, been working independently and mostly investing into early stage startup companies, um, kind of an array of technologies and sectors, but mostly focused on companies that are building things on Bitcoin. Awesome. So opening question, Bitcoin and blockchain, and not as much as Bitcoin, but as cryptocurrency as a whole, especially blockchain, has started to make its way into the music industry. My question for you is, you know, actually, before we even get into that question, first question is for anyone listening, give us like a, a 30 second rundown. What the hell is Bitcoin? And another 30 seconds, what the hell is blockchain? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so big multifaceted concept, but the way that I like to summarize it is Bitcoin is like internet money. It's a new type of money. And I believe it's the best money that's ever existed in history. The big breakthrough with Bitcoin is that it's the first time 
we figured out how to make something digital that is also limited or scarce. And I remember the first time that I heard that statement, I was kind of like reflexively, I was just very skeptical, right? I was kind of calling BS on it. I was like, hey, you know, I, I work in tech. I know how computers work. If you have something on a phone or a laptop or whatever, it's easy to copy stuff. Like if you have a file, why can't you just copy a bunch? And that's how the internet works, right? Um, yeah. So if you have say like a song on your phone or an MP3 file and you send it to somebody else, it's not exactly that like you don't have it anymore and now they have it it's that there's a copy, right? So that's kind of how the internet has always worked. And that's what we've grown very used to. Bitcoin is the first time that that's changed. So the, the innovation was they figured out how to effectively make a limited number. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist, no matter what, for all of time. And it sounds kind of wild, but that number can never be changed because Bitcoin isn't a company, there's no CEO, there's no central party that's controlling this system. It's just open source software that anyone in the world can run for free and tens of thousands of people globally do. And so there's no one person or entity that can exert influence over it or make changes to the network. Anybody can try to make a change but they can't force the rest of the network to follow them. And so that's kind of where the other coins come from actually. Like your listeners probably know there's hundreds, there's actually like thousands of cryptocurrencies yeah. today, right? Um, Bitcoin was the first and, and the notion of a blockchain kind of came into existence as part of Bitcoin. So the block, Bitcoin's blockchain is kind of what fuels all of the, the mechanics under the hood. Um, but now there's a lot of different blockchains. There's a lot of different cryptocurrencies. Um, but some of those effectively just start as someone taking Bitcoin and thinking, oh, you know, maybe it'd be cool if we changed this thing. Like with like Litecoin, for example, they took the Bitcoin code and they changed the, the number of coins and they changed some details about how they're created. And then that brings a new cryptocurrency into existence. Um, but Bitcoin was the first and, and I would love to drive one point home that I think isn't obvious at first for people who start looking into this. Like Bitcoin is very special and very different from all of the others. And this will sound like a bad thing at first, but what makes Bitcoin special is that it, the rules cannot be changed. So to anybody who builds products in Silicon Valley, right? That sounds like a bad thing. Like, you know, it's like yeah. move fast, break things, iterate, add new features, do all this stuff. So it's a little counterintuitive, but like any of the other cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, Litecoin, whatever, Zcash, all those, like they are all kind of centralized in, in one way or another enough that the rules can still be changed. Bitcoin is the only one that no matter how many companies, governments, entities, individuals, whatever, no matter how bad anyone wants to, they cannot change the rules. There can never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. Interesting. Okay, so diving into that, when you got a bunch of the other coins coming out off of Bitcoin and all this fun stuff, how do you see cryptocurrency and blockchain, first off, how do you see it have a positive impact on the music industry? Yeah, for sure. I think there, I'll kind of give like the broad uh, positive impact on the world that I'm optimistic about and then zoom in a little bit to music specifically. So, um, you know, in the world, I think uh, a lot of challenges in the world and a lot of the difficulties that people face today are the result of people not really having control over their money or over their savings. And Bitcoin is interesting, almost if you think about it as this defensive technology. So it lets people protect the value that they've earned. Um, today, if you store your, if you like work and make money, um, there's a bunch of different things you can like use to store that money. And you could like have dollars sitting in a savings account, or you could buy stocks or real estate, all those things. Um, but central banks around the world uh, have been printing more dollars for a very long time. And especially this past year in 2020 with all of the stimulus and the response to the pandemic, uh, they printed a lot of dollars, like trillions of dollars. And so, you know, whether anyone thinks that's like good or bad or right or wrong, the reality of it is that anyone with dollars sitting in a savings account 
that's going to, to make those dollars not able to purchase as much stuff, like prices are going to rise. So it effectively kind of takes savings away from people who have earned it there. And I see Bitcoin as an opportunity for anyone in the world, even if they're in part of the world that doesn't have access to the financial system, maybe the banking infrastructure is unavailable, maybe it's corrupt, they can finally like protect their savings in a way that no one can print more of and no one can like reach into their accounts and grab or even prevent them from using. Okay. So that's kind of like globally what makes me excited. And then I think, uh, especially in music, there's a couple opportunities. Um, the whole like, you know, freedom aspect of it, I think just you've seen a number of artists kind of go independent or not quite uh, into the big buckets of like mainstream labels. And that's become more of a movement in recent years. I know you all are like uh, helping with great things around all that. And I think just like the, the ability to return some leverage to the artists and the creatives is, is really important in this. And I think it actually has the potential too to just change the way that music is distributed and consumed. So today, when you think about the content delivery platforms for this stuff, um, you know, there's YouTube and there's Spotify, there's all these different like platforms out there where you can consume music. And in a lot of ways, it's great compared to what it was before. Like maybe it's less centralized. Anybody with a microphone and camera can kind of, you know, shoot their shot and maybe build a following. And that, that is awesome. But there's still this big complicated web of, advertisers and middlemen and you know now it is kind of becoming more and more centralized in platforms like like youtube that have grown a lot and i think with bitcoin we finally have a protocol for money sort of like the internet gave us a protocol for information and so what i expect to see in the coming decade is for money to kind of be woven into the internet so when you are streaming something, whether it's like a video, music video, song, whatever, um, it won't be so much that like, oh, you have to pause and watch this ad. And it's this very disjointed experience because that's the only way that they can really monetize it. It'll just be that your web browser is able to send very tiny payments using Bitcoin over the wire in real time. Like for every second that you're listening, you can be paying. Um, with some technologies built on Bitcoin, it makes it possible to do instant payments of super tiny amounts, like fractions of a penny. So that opens up some use cases that we've never been able to explore for as long as the internet's been around so far. That's, that's very interesting. And that almost comes in, it would, that would have been interesting to see if that technology was available now during live streaming with COVID. That would have been yeah. very, it's like how long you could be on a live stream, you were getting money pull out. And it's almost like, it's almost like we're 60% of the way there, but we're not like how easy it is now to just like go on my phone, double click my face and send money from Apple pay. It's like, right. it's getting closer, but exactly. And that's really cool. And you know, the fractions and fractions of a penny and that goes into the bigger problem of the fact that streaming and the on-demand streaming world became so fucked over for music artists that now it may change where it's like consumers may be a little pissed because like I have to pay more money, but the artists are going to be getting a lot more percentage, hopefully per stream. Um, because like, I don't know about you, but like when I had Spotify free, when it like first came out, the only ads that were on it was Spotify ads. Like, I don't really think they even had anybody advertising. And so it's like, you know, how are they making money on ad revenue to then pay out to their artists? And, you know, it's the same thing on SoundCloud. Like I go on a SoundCloud and there's like six of the same ads, and like half of them are McDonald's. Um, right. And it's just like, you know, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, to some extent it's like, yeah, you know what? Maybe I would pay fractions of a penny to that. It's almost like how literally, you know, not going down a bad route because I don't think they intended it to go that way. Maybe they did. Um, but the democratization of content management through platforms coming out like OnlyFans, um, mm, yeah. where you can democratize payments and literally say, yes, I like you, I'm going to pay for you. And, you know, I'm going to pay to be a part of your group of fans. And that is interesting. So 
Going off of that, I have one last thing on the positives of it that I want to get your input on before I pass over to Christian to be devil's advocate. Um, okay. when, which is the one of the coolest companies I've seen so far of using blockchain technology in the music industry is a company called Block Party. Mm-hmm. And basically, they use blockchain to basically, if I'm a concert promoter and you buy a ticket from me for 100 bucks and you go sell it to Christian for 120 by using blockchain and the receipts, I get 50% of that resale price that you sold it to Christian for. So now initial ticket events are not getting screwed over by resale prices. Going farther than that, how do you see, because I've also heard on the negative side, blockchain is very slow. And so how do you see that the music industry could use blockchain to actually help artists? Yeah, that is one common criticism that you'll hear of blockchain tech in general is that it is very slow and very kind of, uh, clunky and cumbersome. Um, what what I think that boils down to is that it'll kind of be built in layers, sort of like the internet uh, protocols were built in layers. Mm-hmm. And so right now, what we've known for the last, you know, Bitcoin was created 12 years ago. So for like 12 years now that Bitcoin and blockchain tech has been around, um, all the emphasis has been on like building out the first layer of what I think will be a stack of layers. And so at the, at the base layer, it'll be kind of like a settlement layer when you need maximum security and reliability for these operations. So if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're making some very large transfer of wealth. If you're like buying a house, um, if you're doing something that's thousands of dollars, then perhaps that makes sense because you are willing to wait. uh, You know, you're willing to like wait 30 minutes, 60 minutes for all of the confirmation, all of the mechanics of the blockchain there to like chug away and kind of do their thing to guarantee that that transaction is irreversible and it's set in stone. But it's not ideal for little quick payments. It's not even great for like buying a coffee at your local coffee shop. And it sure is not great for like streaming tiny amounts over the wire in real time as you consume content. So the key there is kind of building layers on top of of that base layer. And that's what we're starting to see happen. Um, There's uh, an especially promising layer two technology on top of Bitcoin called the Lightning Network. And that's what enables some of the use cases I alluded to earlier, where you can do super tiny uh, payments, like fractions of a penny, and they settle instantly over the wire. And, you know, you can integrate them even into internet protocols. Like if you build, this is going to get a little bit nerdy and I won't like go too deep into this, uh, (laughs) but like if you build like an API, like a REST API, for example, if you're like engineering a website, you can now have it charge. You can like set a price for it to do its work. If you want it to return a result and execute, you can kind of like embed a price in it. And only if someone pays that over the wire, will it like do the work, return the result. And so it, it also has this interesting second effect of separating money from identity. So if you look at like how the internet's worked so far, you've had to kind of sign up and register an account everywhere if you want to pay for something. And maybe in some cases it makes sense for the nature of that service to have your identity or at least your email address. Like maybe that's just kind of required for the nature of the business. But in some cases, it's not. In some cases, the only reason they require an email address or knowing who you are is because they need to get paid in one way or another, like someone needs to get paid. And so now you can get more granular there. If you don't actually need someone's identity, you can just have some useful service sitting out there that receives money over the wire from who knows who around the world. Like it's just, it's money being beamed around instantly. Interesting. Yeah. It can get, it can get deep in the music industry. For sure. For sure. So Christian pass us off for our lightning round. Yeah. So first of all, Steven, great to meet you. Haven't had much opportunity to talk yet. I I think this is a really great conversation. (laughs) Uh, This is a great conversation um, and I want to keep going, but before we kind of move into a separate topic uh, we we're doing this new thing called a lightning round. Um, where we're just going to ask you some fun questions and see what your answers are. (laughs) 
Love really, it. I'm down. Really nothing too crazy. Um, Nick, do you have one queued up or should I start us off? Yes. Steven, if animals can talk, which animal would be the rudest? Animal would be the rudest. Uh, <laughs> whew, I don't know. Um, the I feel like the honey badger could probably be pretty rude. Um, the, cool. honey, the, honey, the honey badger don't care. And the honey badger <laughs> just <laughs> lives life. <laughs> does, does his thing. <laughs> Um, okay, so if a zombie apocalypse broke out, where would you go? What would you do? Ooh, uh, so I'm from the Midwest. I'm from a, a small town in Missouri, and oh, I talk to my friends about this often. They, they've <laughs> got the compound out there that they are building, and they know that if anything crazy ever goes down, you know, I'm kind of closer to the West Coast, and I always tell them, You've got uh, the the fortress, you've got the crops and the garden and all that. And I am just going to hop in the car and uh, drive to your place. So. Amazing. <laughs> and seek shelter. Oh, so if you survive the zombie apocalypse, this goes on to the next question. What would be the absolute worst name you could give to your child? <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> levels to this. <laughs> if you survive... The zombie apocalypse, worst name to give to your child. I, <laughs> I don't even know. That's some like, you've got me thinking down the whole rabbit hole of like, all right, that like I, Will Smith, I am legend type of future. I'm like, you know, walking the streets of abandoned uh, cities by myself would be the worst name for a child. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's a, you would not want to want to name the kid. <sighs> something that doesn't seem like zombie food you know you can't uh, <laughs> if there are zombies still roaming around and you're and you're brainy. surviving we're going with yeah. brainy <laughs> yeah, exactly. there we go all okay right. chris you bounce one i got one more all right sweet so if you could eat one cheese for the rest of your life what cheese would it be oh it's blue cheese all day blue cheese every all day. day every time i order anything at my local fast food joints or whatever or the restaurants it's like drop the cheddar replace it with blue cheese incredible i've never heard that before <laughs> i like to be um, unique that's cool. this, that's one, fair. this one is juicy. what secret conspiracy would you like to start Ooh. I feel like startups are uh, are almost like little conspiracies in a fun way. Um, there's a great quote by the investor Peter Thiel, and he says something along those lines. He he was uh, one of the founders of PayPal and uh, yeah. and prominent investor in Facebook, and I think it's something along the lines of uh, a startup is uh, is like a conspiracy. It's the smallest or it's the largest number of people that you can convince of this very contrarian idea to change the world. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I, I think uh, a nice conspiracy to get people into would be a conspiracy to restore some uh, some power to the people using a new type of money. And if enough people get huh. in on that conspiracy, maybe we could change the world. Huh. <laughs> Holy shit, it's I genius. Feel like I learned something about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very right, subtle. Huh? Close us off. This is the lightning round. Last one. Last one. Oh, I didn't even have one prepared. Okay. Hi. Just pick a random. You got pick a whole a random? list. I got a roulette. whole list. All right, roulette. Um, what is invisible but you wish people could see? Invisible but you wish people could see. The number of the amount of rap lyrics that I know. I wish that I could just like. <laughs> just a visual. I, I could just have that as a visual so that people, when I'm living my life, people, people could just be like, wow. Like he's put work into that. It's a warehouse filled to the brim with lyrics. It is. I'd be so much more useful to society if it was like physics or chemistry, not like some foundational science, but I would not trade it for anything in the world. <laughs> the arts are important, Stephen. The arts are important. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I think that'll wrap up the lightning round. Um, I hope that was as fun for you as it was for us. Um, but I really want to get back into this Bitcoin conversation. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, before I was working for Artist Republic, I did a lot of creative work for um, cybersecurity companies. I've been to RSA conference out in San Francisco quite a few times. Um, and I've 
more recently in the past couple of months started dipping my toes in the uh, cryptocurrency water. So I have a very sweet, uh, minute, brief understanding of crypto. And I've invested a little bit into Bitcoin. Some, I think I have like five Satoshis nice. worth of Bitcoin, like not much. Um, but it's my more question- More than most people. It's more than most people, yeah. Um, so I guess my question to you is kind of along the lines of like the negative aspects of uh, mm. cryptocurrency blockchain, how that can negatively affect the music industry. I, you know, as it stands at this very moment, Bitcoin is worth $44,502 and 30 cents. Um, and of course, as we know, uh, with cryptocurrencies, it is very, um, I don't, I don't want to use the word speculative, but it's, it's hard to tell when the Bitcoin value is going to plummet as it has in the past. So um, when you take that into account, what do you think some of those negative side effects of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin can be for the music industry? For sure. Um, it is the wild west out there. Like it's very new territory. Right. And so um, I'm like super optimistic in terms of Bitcoin's potential to transform the world in a positive way in the, in the very, very long term. But along the way there, there's a bunch of hazards, especially for people who are learning about this and trying to get into it. And uh, it's a range of things. I would say one is just the nature of all of the different cryptocurrencies out there. And oftentimes, you know, I think some are well-intentioned projects. They have brilliant people behind them. They're like trying to do good stuff and build new tech. And then on the other end of the spectrum are some things that are just outright scams. And it's effectively like people who are throwing together a PowerPoint deck and trying to convince people that their coin is the hottest thing ever. And if they just invest money in it, then life will be great. And usually the way that plays out is like a bunch of people give their money to that team. And then the team just kind of like sells the token and kind of dumps their holdings on those people and runs away and a bunch of people get burned. So I would encourage anyone new to this space to just be very conservative and kind of have their guard up when it comes to uh, someone trying to convince them why their cryptocurrency is the new hotness. Um, Bitcoin was the first. It's been the biggest every year consecutively since. Um, and I think it's, it's really the, the one with long-term promise, in my opinion. Um, the, some of the other hazards of it are just how easy it is to lose Bitcoin or to lose your investment along the way. So even if you decide to invest in the right coin, maybe you want to buy Bitcoin, how to keep it secure, how to be sure that you're not going to accidentally lose them. Um, make sure that you are trusting reputable software there, reputable companies in the space. Um, take time, like if you know someone who's been in the industry for a while and is well-versed in all of that, uh, seek out recommendations from people you trust um, because there's a lot of people on the internet that will try to guide you towards shady projects. Um, and then the other is just what you mentioned with the volatility. So the price does go way up and way down. So I'd say go in with a long-term mindset. If there is money that you might need to spend in the next like couple months, uh, don't sort of like put it into Bitcoin, assume that it's going to pop and like double and, and then you're going to like take it out and pay bills and life's going to be good. Go into it with a long-term mindset. I, I kind of advocate for a dollar cost averaging. So every week, uh, you know, just pick whatever amount fits into your budget very comfortably that you can hold for at least a year, um, ideally longer, and just put that on cruise control. Just there are companies out there that will let you do automated weekly buys. Swan Bitcoin, I'm an investor in Swan. They're one that I would recommend. There are a couple other great ones too. Um, they'll let you just automatically um, accumulate over time. And so that kind of reduces the risk of that volatility as well. You don't have to worry about putting a bunch of money in and then the next day the price tanks by 20% and you freaking out and stressing about it. So it's, it's a low stress way to invest long-term. Great. That's, that's really great insight. And I think it's important for especially people like me who are just getting into it to understand 
Um, and, you know, we could get really in the weeds about hot and cold storage and all of these different little little aspects about crypto and how it works. Um, you know, you say uh, Bitcoin is, and I think it's considered a, in most mainstream crypto circles, it's like the gold standard of crypto. Yep. Um, and you said you see that being kind of like the gold standard from here on out. Yeah, I, I actually suspect that um, a lot of the use cases and applications that are being attempted on top of other blockchains today, even very prominent ones like Ethereum, I, I kind of see those migrating over time and ending up on Bitcoin um, to where Bitcoin is sort of like the public blockchain of the future. And then at all of these layers on top that haven't existed before, um, hence all the other blockchains where, where these things are being tried, but like now that we can build up on Bitcoin and you can build layers with more features and more capabilities, uh, you can do smart contracts, you can do really fast, cheap payments, uh, you can do tokens and you know tokenize securities of companies and shares of stock and all that fancy stuff. In the past, that wasn't quite as doable on Bitcoin, and now that's totally changing. So over time, I see a lot of those use cases migrating over to Bitcoin's chain. And I also wanted to quickly go back. You know, you mentioned public, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here. Again, I'm just dipping my toes in the water, but with many cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin included, um, whatever you own is public knowledge on the blockchain, correct? Like anyone could go in and uh, look it, up like that you own X amount of Bitcoin? Uh, in a sense. So the blockchain is public. So anyone can sort of, you know, examine that and see uh, all the transactions that are happening that have ever happened in all of history and the addresses associated with those, um, which you could think of like account numbers. Mm -hmm. But those addresses just kind of look like gibberish, right? It's like long strings of text. Yeah. So it's not easy to connect someone's real identity to okay. that. So yeah. there are like for the casual observer looking at the blockchain, there's no like, you know, Stephen Cole has this many Bitcoin. That's definitely not obvious, which is, which is good. <laughs> like that's important. Yeah. Um, but there are ways that some companies can sort of attempt to connect your real identity to activity on the blockchain. Um, like if you, give your ID to, you know, a company in order for you to buy Bitcoin, and then you withdraw those coins, then that that link kind of exists. And there are some businesses out there that try to make a business out of connecting people's real identity to activity on the blockchain. Uh, personally, I'm a pretty big advocate of privacy. I think that privacy is super important. I want people to be able to only reveal as much as they want about their financial activity. And so I'm excited about technology that makes it difficult to track people on the blockchain. There are ways to um, mix your coins together using technologies called things like CoinJoin. Um, so there are ways to effectively protect yourself and take steps to remain even more anonymous um, if you want. But already just like, even if you don't do that, it's already, you know, worlds better than say like the credit card system, right? Like the right. most of the popular alternatives where it's just very clearly linked. Right, for sure. And, you know, I, I want to try and keep this tying back to the music industry. You know, of course, this is a music based yep. podcast. So um, in terms of Bitcoin, privacy, everything that we've really covered, you know, how do you see all of this being applied towards the individual as an artist, you know, say I'm an artist and I want to, you know, release some music on Artist Republic. Um, you know, could you mm -hmm. see companies like Artist Republic building out some kind of a system to accept crypto um, as a form of payment or, you know, what is, what is your kind of overall view on all of that? Yeah, many different levels to it. Um, I think the content distribution platforms have some new options and they've they've been in their infancy uh you know very recently right so it's not stuff that's mainstream at all yet but in the in the next you know couple years five years certainly um i see this becoming much more mainstream where the content delivery systems will potentially enable people to just pay 
over the wire using Bitcoin per like very granularly, you know, you can only pay for as much as you listen to if, if you want um, both the consumer and the, the content creator. Um, there's not going to be quite as much margin being taken by middlemen and advertisers. So hopefully the, the creator gets to keep more of their, their wealth, their hard earned money. Um, and then I think some very straightforward ways for artists who are interested in this stuff to start is just to, you know, offer, uh, like let people pay you in Bitcoin. There are some artists, um, you know, I'm friends with a rapper in Dallas, uh, shout out to King Spencer. He's been putting out a lot of good content, um, on Bitcoin actually, he's a big Bitcoiner too. And so he offers a discount for anybody who pays for his services using Bitcoin. Um, and that, and he, you know, does like music editing and video recording and production as well. And so, that's just, if you're a creative and you're interested in like getting into Bitcoin, it's there, like, there's no downside, right. To offering people to pay you in Bitcoin, you might get some customers that you otherwise wouldn't if they're Bitcoin enthusiasts. And then if you give a little bit of a discount for it, then that can be great because maybe Bitcoin will appreciate in value. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and so one more question from me before I pass it back to Nick, um, you know, what is your advice for artists in general who are trying to understand Bitcoin? In general, for artists trying to understand Bitcoin, I would say um, this will sound counterintuitive, right? Uh, normally, you you want to understand stuff that you invest in, like don't invest in things you don't understand. That's obviously like very generally good sound advice. Um, but I think on the flip side, there's this intimidation that can happen where like the idea of buying Bitcoin, you can just kind of build it up in your head, right? And it becomes this scary thing. It's like, oh, I don't own any Bitcoin. Should I invest in Bitcoin? I want to be sure to do it the right way. And, and you just kind of build that idea up and then you, you never end up acting on it because it seems so big. And I'd encourage people to just kind of punch through that, like not in a high risk way. Don't put like a lot in before you understand what you're dealing with, but it's pretty quick and easy nowadays to buy like $5 worth buy $10 worth. And once you actually have that, you know, you can do that within 30 minutes at these companies nowadays, it's pretty streamlined. And so if you go from zero to having five bucks worth of Bitcoin in 30 minutes, then you're over that psychological hurdle. And then you've got some and you have some skin in the game. And even just that step just like is a powerful incentive for you to just learn a little more every day and you'll kind of see it. And you know, you're like, oh, I I'm, I'm a Bitcoiner, I have Bitcoin. Um, and then there are a bunch of educational resources um, that, are, that are great out there. There's an article called the bullish case for Bitcoin, which is fantastic. That's one of the, the pieces of content I usually recommend to anyone new. Um, and there's a very tiny book called the little Bitcoin book that, uh, that gives a summary of why this stuff might be important and be a big deal. So those are two pretty good resources for starters. And then there's a bunch of great podcasts. Um, uh, the Stefan Levera podcast, um, the Tales from the Crypt podcast are a couple that I would recommend to, to listeners. Obviously, this is a podcast, so that format is probably interesting to people. Uh, so those are some great ones. Cool. Well, with that, um, that was another great, amazing episode of Artist to Artist. Thank you, Stephen, for hopping on and diving into blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, uh, animals, zombie apocalypses, and so much other stuff. <clears throat> With that, this week, we're going to change up the five-star rating. If you give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, please put at the bottom of your rating a random question that you want us to ask during our lightning round, and we will possibly include it, if it makes sense. Um, but please give us your best question by giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, whatever. Comment below. Let us know what you want us to ask for the next one. And with that, we will see you all next week. The first time I heard Bitcoin, I just struck it off. And it's a lot more than the way to let you spend money from one place to another. It's actually a whole new type of money entirely. And so with that hit me, I was just like, damn, like I got to learn more. I got to learn as much as I can. Don't make it such a big deal in your head. Download, cash app, download one. Five, five bucks, five, ten bucks worth. Look, I'm going.
Bitcoin, Bitcoin, be small. Monetary cheat codes. Running up Satoshi, they can't understand my lingo. All I hear is bells like Jingo. Every day is Christmas.